at Selwyn College, Cambridge, before going on to join the Royal Engineers. During a distinguished career, he served in countries ranging from Bosnia to Belize. He oversaw operations during the invasion of Iraq and was recently Commander in Chief of Land Forces. He was appointed the professional head of the British Army in September of last year. General Wall, welcome to the UK. Great pleasure to be here. If you'd asked me in the 1970s when I was an undergraduate uh, whether I'd expect to be standing here talking to you now, the answer would be emphatically no. <laughs> um, but here we go. What a great opportunity. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes or so, and then I'll fill any questions you want to throw at me for as long as you're um, prepared to play. Um, I think um, what I'll do is seek to explain to you how the British Army is um, facing the challenges of the future. And in doing so, I hope to, first of all, convey a strong sense of the acute difficulty that we have in anticipating what we as an army shall be doing um, operationally in the years ahead with any credibility or accuracy. Second, to explain the innate and growing complexity of military engagement in any modern situation. Third, to expose the economic pressures that we're under in seeking to deliver our role in the nation's future security. And then to highlight our very high dependence on talent. For it is people as well as technology, perhaps more so in the Army than in our sister services, the Navy and the Air Force, who are and will increasingly be the key to our success operationally as one of the nation's critical institutions. An institution like this university with a very colourful history and one which must look hard to the future in fast changing times to sustain the excellence to which we naturally aspire. As an undergraduate at Selwyn College reading engineering, I was also at the time a serving officer in the Royal Engineers with a natural uh, professional interest in current strategic issues and military history. At that time, in the midst of the Cold War, identifying the most significant source of threats to our security and values in the West was rather a no-brainer. NATO nations were spending up to 5% of their gross domestic product, compared with about 2% nowadays on the uh, manning and equipping of significant land, maritime and air forces to deter both conventionally and strategically the Soviet-led Warsaw Pact. We then had an army of about a quarter of a million, made up of about 180,000 regulars and the rest were reserves, committed for the most part to a relatively small sector with about 100 kilometer frontage, uh, looking into Germany, eastern Germany, across the inner German border, and facing what was known as the Group of Soviet Forces in Germany. And as you would expect, we studied our enemy in detail. We exercised endlessly with carte blanche across the German countryside. It was an era of relative predictability, or so we were thought, albeit the consequences of deterrence failing would have been catastrophic. And it certainly got the nation's attention. If you'd asked me then about the places we've actually fought and operated since those days in the mid 1970s, they might have conjured up a range of historic points. The South Atlantic, for example, the scuttling of the German pocket battleship Graf Spee in 1939 in the Battle of the River Plate. In Mesopotamia, General Townsend's shocking defeat of Kut in 1916 or the more successful establishing of the state of Iraq by the British um, through the mandate in the 1920s. In the Balkans, the shooting of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914, that triggered the Great War. Or the actions of Sir Fitzroy MacLean in support of the partisans in Yugoslavia in World War II. In Africa, you can take your pick. Wolsey's Ashanti expedition in the 1880s, Two VC recipients in the Boer War, John Chard at Rourke's Drift and Sir Redvers Buller for the abortive operations at Spine Cop in an attempt to relieve Ladysmith in 1900. And then, of course, Afghanistan, another rich tapestry of examples.
plenty to reflect on there, good and bad, but let's alight upon General Roberts' successful campaign in the Second Afghan War from 1878 to 1880. You can see where I'm heading. The monolithic Soviet threat dissolved in the face of the military and economic overmatch of the West without a shot being fired. But far from heralding an era of global stability, this gave way to an era of more diverse and less direct threats to our national interests and security. I don't recall anybody predicting at the time that the British Army's battles would be won in places like Goose Green, Mount Tumbledown, Bosnia, Kosovo, Basra, Alamara, Helmand, Sangin, or Kandahar, rather than the towns and cities of the North German plain. Or that the demonic figures of that era would be people like Jeff Thierry, Radha Karadic, Saddam Hussein, twice, Muqtada al-Sala, Mullah Omar, or Osama bin Laden, rather than the Soviet Politburo and their generals. Or that our intelligence efforts would be consumed by seeking to understand the likes of the Argentinian army, the Iraqi army, the various ethnic factions of the former Yugoslavian army in Bosnia, the Kosovo Liberation Army, the RUF and the West Side Boys in Sierra Leone, Jaish al Mahdi in southern Iraq, or the Taliban for that matter, rather than the Third Shock Army, which in the end disbanded in front of us in 1989. So, my first key deduction in this talk is that of unpredictability. Who can tell me where we shall have fought and operated in 30 years' time when some of you could well be standing here and I hope you are? Anybody who pretends that future events likely to evolve the UK armed forces can be predicted with any accuracy or clarity is ignoring these lessons of recent history, let alone going even further back. And particularly in a period of economic stringency, when awkward choices have to be made, this is a very inconvenient reality. The old maxim, you don't choose wars, they choose you, will for sure continue to apply. I want to turn now to the character of those conflicts that we have such a dismal track record in anticipating. But let me first recount the tale of Lord Uxbridge on the eve of Waterloo, to add a little bit of colour. Now, those of you who are real students of history might have a different version of this, but I'll give you mine. Uxbridge is with his force in Waterloo on the 17th of June, 1815, and he's with his staff in a house having a few drinks. And they know that the following morning it's all going to start happening. And uh, some of the gang say to him, Uxbridge, have you contemplated? fact that you're actually the second in command of this enterprise. And if Wellington were to copy it, <coughs> do you know enough about his plan to be able to take over? Huxley says that's quite a good point actually. No, the answer is emphatically no. I think I'd better go and see it. So he goes across the road to, uh, to um, Wellington's headquarters where similar things are going on except that Wellington's asleep. Very important cat map for you know whatever he's going to do next. <coughs> My lord, um, I've got a bit of a problem. Yes, that's because what is it? Well, sir, I don't want to sort of be mortgage about this, but if you copy it tomorrow, I'm probably the second in command, and it'd be rough, it'd be helpful if I had a rough idea of what the plan is, so that I can ensure that we achieve victory. And Wellington says, don't be daft, that's because the plan is to be the French. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, my lord, do you mind if I, we go into a bit more detail? Um, well, look, um, don't, you know, don't be apprehensive about this. I mean, let me ask you some, some questions. First, which of me or Bonaparte is going to attack first? And Oxbridge uh, said, well, uh, Bonaparte, of course, my lord. Well, Oxbridge, um, how would I know how I'm going to conduct that until I know how he is presenting his attack? That's the end of the conversation. Well, I think we've come on a little bit since those days. Trends do offer us a little more comfort in predicting the fact of conflict, recognising that we must try to guard against the inevitable tendency to pr prepare to refight the last war, which, despite being 
the best handrail we can find is often misleading. Let me add, I don't think the military the only people do this. But in this situation that we're in at the moment, um, facing extreme sort of economic uh, challenges, I fear we may be a subject to a special case of this malaise. Particularly as we look at things in the aftermath of what have been very uncomfortable experiences <coughs> for our politicians and so on, and the nation, I think, um, in the aftermath of the campaign since 9-11 in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the malaise is this. It's the tendency to prepare for the last war by imagining that we could have avoided fighting. The inclination to pretend that such engagements will, for the most part, be discretionary to assume that if only we can be more enlightened, we can pursue the national interest and our chosen role in the world by a range of means other than military intervention. And therefore we can invest less as a nation in those intervention capabilities in the military. Now this might work for a bit, but I wouldn't bet the farm. As I suggested earlier, the evidence of history is that wars choose us. Now, clearly, we do need to be able to anticipate in order to make the best choices about our military education and training, our force structure, our organisation, and our balance of investment in military capabilities. And in defence, we need to be able to plan further ahead than the political conditions and normal government habits tend to allow. The analysis in the recent national security strategy of last year on which our recent defence review was based, presents us with a complex global security picture. A number of changing phenomena are emerging, any of which, taken alone, presents significant threats and challenges. And when a mixture of these coincide, the compound effects could be extremely destabilised. And, you know, you could list them yourself, but I'll include the following. Social and demographic trends likely to increase instability, Population growth outpacing the development of state governments. Inadequate infrastructure, increasing unemployment, competition for limited resources. Uh, environmental factors adding fuel to a potential fire. Climate change is bringing about an increase in droughts and flooding, exacerbating food shortages and fragilities in infrastructure. Spawning mass population movements potentially, which will be a very real and potential source of conflict. As groups or states attempt to protect what little resources they have from others that seek to acquire them uh, desperately need. And of course such instabilities provide fertile ground for dissident organisations to pursue extremist interests. Uh, digital technology has extended the reach of those groups, both state and non-state actors who wish to attack our values and our interests, both in our homeland here in the UK, but also globally. And this communications revolution has given once isolated and impotent groups, even individuals, the ability to export their narrative or ideology without limitation as they fight to win people's perceptions. And of course, unlike us, they're not encumbered by the requirement to tell the truth. Technical knowledge and complex devices are no longer the preserve of developed states. Anyone with access to the internet and a mail address has the potential to use relatively sophisticated weapons. And of course the internet itself, which is currently being used by about 30% of the world's population uh, and rising, is a weapon in its own right. <coughs> Cyber attacks already well established practice and will increasingly become so states, businesses and organisations establish their infrastructure around the World Wide Web. In the interconnected world of the 21st century, so too are the UK's key interests globally. Isolationism is not an option for us, and the national security strategy recognises this. Our national interests are now inextricably linked with and affected by events <coughs> and conditions across the world. I was at a meeting this afternoon where we were discussing that Middle uh, East events from Tripoli, uh, Benghazi across to Cairo, the Yemen, and so on, uh, were completely unpredicted three weeks ago. And these events do highlight the 
potential for all sorts of clashes between both secular entities and religious entities and the extremism that lives off them to cause huge difficulties. And with such global pressures being brought to bear, conflict will sometimes be inevitable. Fragile or failed states will be the most likely flashpoints, but not exclusively the only ones. State on state conflict can't be ruled out, but it's highly likely to be complicated, if not overtaken, by asymmetric methods. So if we're to guarantee our national interests overseas, we have to be prepared to deploy all leaders of government to secure them. We must recognise that in extremists, military force may need to be projected and deployed, most likely as part of an international coalition effort, not only to share the military burden of cost, but also to ensure, very importantly, international legitimacy. Hence, our continued emphasis on playing our role in alliances. And I will add to this important point that I think is going to be highlighted by the Chilcot inquiry, that there is a requirement for us in the future to make sure we mobilise the senses of the nation. The government and the military themselves are not sufficient. Uh, the nation is an essential part of sustaining support for an operation and needs to be brought in at the beginning, especially for operations that have any scale, where we're required to pull out very large reserves, or uh, long-term endurance. And I would say that lack of an understanding <coughs> of the military investment, uh, the <coughs> military instrument in this country, is a threat to our ability to engage in those sorts of activities. So how should defence prepare for these uncertainties and potential security challenges? We have to design forces that have broad utility and the agility to adjust between different modes of operation rapidly so we can engage across the ambit of anticipated scenarios and of course succeed. This gets more challenging as one anticipates a world in which there may be a range of smaller operations rather than fewer large-scale ones, as economies of scale are lost and specialist or niche capabilities, which are expensive for small defence forces to sustain, become more thinly spread. So we need a diverse set of capabilities, starting with intelligence and our ability to understand the problem and our potential adversaries, so that we can design a response as part of a coalition or a national force having galvanised the necessary political will and established logistics. <coughs> Usually, in the past, through the United Nations organisation, but who knows what organisations in the future. We will need, as part of this set of capabilities, strategic reach to get forces there by air and sea, the right mix of combat power for all three of our armed services, the command and control mechanisms to deploy them, and a responsive <coughs> logistic support system in the future, making best use of contractors. And once engaged, we will need the agility to alter our techniques to deal with resilient and ingenious firms. Increasingly, our military efforts are likely to need to be integrated with those from other agencies, outside the military, international development organisations, NGOs and indigenous forces. Where we are smart enough, we will seek to prevent conflict in failing or failing states by delivering early supporting effects, including training and equipping others to deliver security. But history tells us that this is easier said than done. My second key deduction then is about the diverse range of capabilities we shall need, about the complexities of employing them especially in a multinational coalition or alliance, and about the agility we need to inculcate in ourselves to be able to adapt to unpredictable and shifting situations. Now then, for money. It's self-evident that in times of plenty, the choices needed to deliver a balanced force are less difficult than in periods of economic crisis. And we're in one of those now. Robust defence and strong economies get hand in hand. Weak economies will inexorably deliver weaker defence. And you know, we face a clear risk. Our nation is by choice confronting a very difficult financial deficit very robustly in the belief that it can reprieve the longer term damage that would otherwise occur to the economy. 
the military is directly affected to the tune of up to 8% reductions in the defence budget by 2014. All of this, uh, you may well know, is clearly documented. We shall still have a budget of around 2% of GDP, if one includes the costs of all operations in Afghanistan throughout the four-year period of the recent <coughs> spending review. And this conforms to the NATO assumed minimum investment in defence. In this period, we face some stark choices over the balance of our investment between and within each of the armed services. But defence also has a very strong incentive to contribute to a stronger economy in accordance with the government's plan because we shall need real terms growth ourselves in defence expenditure in the latter half of this decade if the force structure requirements for 2020, as articulated in last year's Defence Review White Paper, are going to be full. And such is the long-term nature of defence planning to procure equipment and develop complex capabilities that we shall need to know reasonably soon about the funding for the later years of the decade. So I've got no need here to labour the deduction of short-term choices will be awkward and to restore balance we will need real terms growth in expenditure in the latter part of this decade for defence. Now I want to talk about talent. Now I mentioned people early on and I want to return to that theme. In common with most institutions, people are the Army's most valuable asset and we need talented ones. The environment in which our people deploy becomes, as I suggested earlier, more and more complex, and so their quality becomes more and more perfect. We must continue to attract, recruit, and retain the best. The last 20 years of operations, notably the last eight years in Iraq and Afghanistan, has bred an army of unparalleled professionalism and broad experience. Just and I include the one reason that. <laughs> This is truly a warrior generation and will, of course, provide the leaders of the future, both in the forces, but also in other walks of life. Throughout the period of change, success is going to depend on our ability to ensure that our soldiers and officers remain of the very best quality. The traditional view, traditional view of this would be the kind of playing fields of Eton view, you know, brave people with character who can lead and inspire others. Well, we certainly need all of that in a modern form, but we also need clever, lateral thinkers who can conceptualise, deliver agility and change, who can articulate our needs in government, who can shape and, imp and implement communication strategies to outwit opponents in cyberspace. This talent is needed in each of our services, but also in the civil service, our fourth service in MAD, where so much of this competence is historically resided and will, if anything, be in greater demand still in the future. We have a stark onus to sustain an intellectual constituency <coughs> within defence, to educate our people for a career of military service from the lower tactical level all the way through to military strategic thinking at the top of the government. And in this, we have a particular constraint, which is that we're a bottom fair organisation. We recruit our people at the beginning of their careers, and for the time being at least, we require, them, we require them to serve for several decades to get to the top of the tree. Raw material is going to be critical, and our offer to the youth of the nation will be a key factor in our attractiveness as a vocational way of life with relevance to the global challenges of the future. I'm not here to recruit, far from it, but I will emphasise that phenomenal opportunities and rewards of a career in the armed services and particularly in the army. So by way of summary, before I hand over to you for questions, first, defence is an acutely unpredictable business. Wellington, as you will know, survived the 18th of June at Waterloo, but Uxbridge had his leg shot. In fact, it was taken off in, under surgery in a table in a house in Waterloo, where in later life he subsequently returned to Waterloo and had dinner. Um, so the medics obviously did okay. Um, we do need 
in defence, a balanced por um, portfolio of capabilities to ensure success in an increasingly complex world. In straitened times, when balance may be unaffordable, the chances of making the right choices between those capabilities have been proven by history. The economy plays a pivotal role in our fortunes, and we know that defence will be contributing to deficit reduction in the early years, whilst needing a significant real terms uplift thereafter if the defence requirements of this nation for 2020 and beyond are to be afforded. And finally, and by no means the least, by no means least, our dependence upon genuine talent and defence, and especially in the army, is, if anything, 